Welcome to this episode of the All Together Show. I'm your host, Eric Satz, and with me today, Rachel Horowitz, who I like, you know, some people are listening, some people are watching. I like to say, I like to do one of these, like with me today is this person, Rachel Horowitz. And of course, they have to look at the they have to look at the hand and the finger and and see who I'm who I'm pointing at. And of course, uh, this episode, like all episodes, brought to you by Alto IRA. Uh, enough of that. So, Rachel, I look at your professional background, um, starting with the work that you did with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, going to Google, Twitter, Facebook, Coinbase, back to Google. Now Han Ventures. So if we think about it, it's like you're saving the world, then you go to search, then you go to social, then you go to crypto, and now you're Web3. I mean, talk about an ability to uh, pick the right horse to ride on, but (laughs) I think that talks about you as a jockey more than the horse. So with that sort of professional background with that everybody now has, that's all sort of well and good and kind of interesting. But this is really about you. In your own words, who is Rachel, Hor- Rachel Horowitz? Well, I've never been described as a jockey, except it does make sense because I'm very, very short. So I, I You're like the it. jockey of your own life, Rachel. <laughs> I'm very, very small, but big personality. Who am I? I mean, I don't like to have... My professional life, I think I'm like a lot of people where my professional life doesn't define me, although it's been extremely satisfying and gratifying, and I feel lucky in a lot of ways. Um, But right now, the best way to describe me is I'm a mom. Um, I'm a Californian these days. Um, And uh, yeah, I think that's like, and I'm a wife. I think that's the best way. Actually... And another, and I'm a daughter. Um, that's really important to me as well. So that's how I would describe myself, if that makes sense. So we can dig into that like immediately mm-hmm. because, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna actually start with I'm a Californian, sort of right now. Mm-hmm. That suggests to me that maybe you didn't grow up in California. Where 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 were you born? Are you do you have siblings? Tell us a little bit about your childhood. I was born, no, I did not, I was not born in California. I was born in Seattle, Washington. So I'm a Pacific Northwest native. Um, I actually married a guy from Washington State as well, um, who was from a rural side of the state, the eastern side of the state. But my mom is a second generation Seattle light. And, uh, big people, you know, with my last name and, um, and I identify as Jewish, but my mom is actually, um, Italian. She's half Italian and and technically half Mexican, but she was sort of raised in this big Italian matriarchy. And so I was raised in Seattle among a very large Italian family, like very large, pretty traditional. I went to Catholic school as a kid. Um, and then my dad was from Miami beach, um, son of a Jewish doctor who made his way out West, met my mom. Um, they're still married. They, they got married quite young. My mom had me when she was quite young. She was 19. Um, and so they raised me in the Pacific Northwest. And so they're very, um, outdoorsy and down to earth. And I have a little brother. He's 18 months younger than me. He's still in the Pacific Northwest. Um, yeah, so I'm the, I'm the oldest and I, I loved Seattle. I went to school there. I never thought, I I thought I would leave one day, but I really did love it. And I think I'm really family oriented, but I have been in California now for a really long time in the Bay area since professionally, you know, I, I was kind of drawn to the place, um, because of the technology industry and, um, it's become a little bit of an identity now. I, I like really <laughs> like California is wild and pro- has problems and is not perfect, but I love the weather. I sort of love what it represents in a lot of ways. I don't know. I really, I'm enjoying. Oh, we're going to the- dig in there. We're yeah, going to dig in yeah. there. So, what? Um, yeah. So I kind of think of myself as like a Californian these days. Yeah. Uh, okay. What about, what does California represent that you love california is and, like wait i'm, I'm going to interrupt you for a second so yeah. i also want to be specific as to whether we're talking about california 
or we're talking about the Bay Area where you are? Because being from the Bay Area and being from Southern California are like being from France and being from England. Yeah, that's true. That is very true. And I've only recently started spending more time in Southern California um, just because of time. I have the time and even business and and pleasure and, you know, is leading me there and I have family there and friends there. Um, but I'm I'm in the Bay Area, so I'm very Northern California. I'm in the East Bay, um, so which is a little different, I think, than even parts of the Bay Area. So I think the peninsula is its own culture, and the city, you know, San Francisco is its own thing. And I've very I lived in the city for a while, but I've kind of put down roots in the East Bay. Um, it's sunny, you know. It's really really diverse in terms of all the different types of people who are here. Um, and so I think, you know, technology has definitely shaped the place for sure, but it's also had, you know, social movements, uh, obviously in the past, um, there's several universities in the area. Um, so it's, it's kind of both, it's down to earth in some ways. It's absolutely not down to earth. It's its own bubble in other ways. Um, but what it represents to me and the surrounding kind of areas, I love the the mountains. I love the ocean. I love how close nature is always here and, and how you can enjoy it year round. Um, but it, I just read a book about the history of California. I keep forgetting the name of the author, but he's famous. Um, it's just called California. And <laughs> it's just a, the, you know, it's just a place. I mean, where people come to reinvent themselves and redefine themselves and try to redefine the world and whether it's art or science or social issues. It's a wild place. Like you have to have the stomach for it in some senses because, and it's funny how we have like wildfires. Like it literally, it's the kind of place that kind of burns down and gets rebuilt over and over again. And even the natural, um, the natural world here is like combustible in that way. And I think the human experience in the history of California has been combustible. So it's, I always think of it like, it, this is, you know, how snakes lose their skin and then it's like a whole new snake. It's, I think California is like that. So if you're kind of traditional or conservative or you like the same thing, this isn't necessarily the place for you. But if you like to be surrounded by people who are up for an adventure or interested in thinking in new ways or outside of the box, um, you know, or or just being part of like a very diverse natural world where you have access to all these different things. California is is kind of fun for for folks like that. So it's got. I think there's a part of me that has you know likes an adventure, and I I don't know if I could ever stay in one place for too long. I've been here a while and I'm raising my kids here, but I get antsy, and I think California kind of speaks to my antsiness sometimes, and it it's um keeps me keeps keeps things interesting. So it's it's really um interesting to me to try and understand how 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 you get from, you know, sort of the beginning of your life to kind of what you just communicated to oh. to everyone listening. And so if I take you back to middle school and high school, was that public or private? That was public. So uh, elementary school was was a Catholic school, and then um, middle school and high school were were public schools. Yeah, so I'm a I'm a public school kid, and I and I went to the University of Washington, so also public university kid for sure. Yeah, and and during that, so you you're you're not you're an older sister, but you're not too much older. Mm -mm. Were you and your brother close? We were really close. People, um, we look alike. I think we were only a year apart. So my, you know, my kids are 22 months apart, but they're, they're two grades apart. My brother and I were only one year apart, which is rare. You I like, don't see that actually too often. Right. So I think we had a, um, a reputation. People thought we were twins a lot of the time. That's how <laughs> close we are. And we actually look a lot alike. Like literally I look lucky for him. Oh yeah. <laughs> I think lucky. Uh, I, I, I think I make a better looking dude in some ways, but he's, um, so yeah, so we were really close. We both went to the UW, right, one right after the other, and um, and uh, kind of have very similar. I think my parents, in a lot of ways, are really entrepreneurial. Um, 
it's like my mom went to college. She was the first in her family to go to college. She did it when we were kids. And my dad um, kind of was entrepreneurial in his own way. He was in sales, but he also started his own businesses. So I had exposure to kind I was in this kind of in the suburbs in public school in kind of a working class area, not not even not upper middle class at all. And but I because of my parents, I had exposure. My mom became like a, a professional, a, a, um, a CFO eventually by the time I was in high school. So I started to get exposure to like a professional class. And I started to see there were like people whose grandparents went to college and their great grandparents went to college and they were like on their fifth generation of college and they were lawyers and doctors and it went back, back, back. And I just wasn't exposed to that at all. I like had educated parents who became professionals, but it was very, there was a lot of like hustle and a lot of hard work, kind of like a grind a lot of it being like both street smart and having a lot of common sense, but having earning, earning trust through like integrity and a lot of personality, like just being like, I think my parents were people, other people wanted to have around and to work with having energy. So looking back at, you know, my upbringing and then coming to an area, like at the time I did in the Bay area in the tech industry, where I think my style and my personality and what I have to offer were really embraced. It wasn't not very like traditional or blue bloody or like the partner of the firm is now my son. You know, it's <laughs> it's a very like entrepreneurial, you know, kind of energetic and vibe. And I think my parents um, and my brother is very similar to me. And and we neither one of us we I had you know we had like the grades and the academic ability to maybe go on like a fairly straightforward path through law school or, you know, kind of professional paths. But we both kind of just like jammed through undergrad and then we're like off and running in the business world as soon. And and politics for me just wanted to work like as soon as possible. And that's, that's worked out for me. So yeah, I think that's like a, that's kind of, to me, that's the connection between this like upbringing in Seattle, public school, no one fancy at my schools, like nothing fancy about it. Going, staying in state from just for financial reasons, just to um, avoid debt. My parents, you know, they, fortunately for me, they could afford to pay for school, but only in state. Otherwise I would have had to take out loans. So I just made that decision and I'm so glad I did. And I feel really fortunate that they were able to cover most of those costs. But yeah, just like a, I, I look around and I'm like, oh, I was never going to be the kid that is as much as I sort of wanted to kind of went on a more like traditional academic path. I think there's like an ener- energizer bunny element to my family and to my parents and to my brother and I um, that's sort of part entrepreneurial, part just like put me in coach, l- like give me an opportunity and I think I can like do a really good job. So we kind of had that confidence early on. And I think that's, that's what my brother and I have in common in a lot of ways. Yeah. I love that answer, by the way. And, <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting because you talked about the entrepreneurial um, sort of spirit and to a degree path that, that your parents took, um, which has, in my opinion, as an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. great benefits to your children. We're both mm-hmm. parents. Mm -hmm. Um, but it doesn't come without risk and it doesn't come without, uh, stress and anxiety. Yeah. Did that, did that exist for you and your brother growing up? Yeah, there was stress. There was risk. There was a lot of risk taking in my family, saying that with my parents. Um, and it's absolutely translated to my life. I kind of feel like my life now can be cut into like pre, you know, graduating college till turning 40. That's like a very clear era for me. And it's kind of a very clear personal era and it's a very clear professional era. And when I look back, it's, and now I feel like I've just embarked, I'm starting out on like a whole new kind of chapter or season or almost like book of my life, honestly. And when I look back at that, the last 20 years, um, it's just I like looking back at 20 year old Rachel and 28 year old Rachel and I just threw myself into these 
you know, risky, somewhat, somewhat risky. Although to me, they never felt, they, they never felt that all that risky financially. You know, I had to take, I guess I could have been paid more at more traditional places, but from a base salary perspective, I felt really lucky to just get my foot in the door. I mean, like getting a job at Twitter just felt like amazing. And, you know, I, I wanted the Coinbase job really badly, really badly. And I worked really hard for that. I wanted a chance to lead. Um, so I felt really, even though I ended up again, you know, the stock based comp takes over in my base salary and that people would call that sort of risky or crypto feels risky to, to some people, or at least it did back then. To me, it just felt like from a, from a, the experiences that I want to have and the, um, work experiences I want to have and the opportunities I I'd love to have a chance at. So in the case of Coinbase, it was leading in the case of Twitter, it was like, just get me into a startup of this side that I think is going to have a huge impact on that comms team seems like no matter what happens, that will open amazing doors for me. So I think people always say, wow, you just take these risks and you go for it. And to me, it just felt like I would just like die to have that job. I would just like give anything to have that job. And sometimes I'm a long shot for that job, but it doesn't matter. I'm still going to throw myself into it and try my best to get it. And then if I do get it, I'm going to try myself, try my best to like kill it, you know, and um, so it's not that that risky, but I have people ask me about risk all the time, but it is stressful. I do think like that those those last 20 years, I started my family. I was in high growth environments like the whole time. Um, I was um, my my you know, Katie Hahn, who's who I work for at Hahn Ventures, she talks about a lot about knowing a job 50, knowing a job cold 50%. And then the other 50% should be new. And that's where the growth is. And it's very uncomfortable. And I look at literally the past 20 years, and I think I was just only in uncomfortable positions. I can totally trace that back to my parents, to my mom and dad. You know, I think they were constantly throwing themselves into opportunities in the Seattle area where, you know, they felt like they had half the job down cold, but probably the other half was going to be a stretch for them or they were going to be learning. Um, So I can see those things connected. I don't know that I handled stress that well over the past 20 years. And by not handling it well, I think, I think I just don't feel stress emotionally but I think like physically I like end up manifesting it. And that's so, what I'm dealing with now. Yeah. No, so, so, so Rachel, you must know, <laughs> I, I, I know you read books. There is no <laughs> such thing as like the disconnect between the mind and the body. No, we can, and we can, we can tell ourselves that, that it's not the same, but yeah. it is the same. And I think people, you know, have you ever heard the question, if you could go back and write, you know, 20 year old you a letter or, you know, and and give yourself advice. Some people always say, well, I have no regrets, but I don't have regrets, but I have so much advice for younger me, that 40 something me now. Um, I would Can I ask for the top three things? Well, the top, I mean, one would be, it's all going to be okay. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't, you don't have to give up certain things and an opportunity. So like a maternity leave, like you can just take a maternity leave. And while you're on the maternity leave, you're never going to get that time again with for yourself at that age with that baby and you don't have to even if the jo- even if they like they shouldn't it would be illegal and bad but even if they fired you you'll be okay and so there's just things you know that you can't control and so enjoy the things you can and you know don't worry so much about um some worst case scenario that if you're not constantly like leaned in and succeeding and, um, um, you know, achieving something or being productive that somehow it's all going to, everything you've worked for is going to slip away. I think I would tell myself to chill out a little bit. I think the second thing would be, um, just physically take better care of yourself. I mean, I definitely smoked in my early twenties. I was on political campaigns, all those dudes smoke. So to hang (laughs) with the dudes, I would like, and I was younger, but I would go out in the back and like smoke with them. And then I sort of got addicted and it was kind of gross. When I met my husband, we were dating and he was like, I really love you. And I think you're great, but like, I will not marry someone who smokes this much. It's And I would go to my friends, you know, my, and I was like, I'm not going to let any guy tell me how to live my life. Screw that. That's, and they're like, Oh my God, you're not, you're not going to let this guy walk for cigarettes. That's also crazy. So it's like, fair. 
So um, I would take better care of my, you know, I think I dealt with stress from bad things like not eating as well as I should or eating enough as I should, you know, not smoking, not drinking, baking in um, better habits earlier um, probably would have just made some of the highs less stressful and some of the lows less, I think, hard. So to your point, like I didn't connect the physical part of kind of being like a marathoner professionally and being, if you're going to be in startups and you're going to be in high growth environments and you're going to deal with like very high stakes, you know, in in a profession that I don't even think I realized until just recently is like very stressful, you know, where the communication (laughs) is on the front lines of like the craziest, you know, stuff in business and especially in the tech world. And I just don't think I, I think I took all that for granted because it's all I ever knew. And now looking back, I think I'd be able to tell myself, you're in a marathon. This is crazy. You're, you'll never be this busy again. You're working like 14 hour days. You're doing high stakes, high pressure work. You need to treat this like a, a marathon and treat your body as well as you're treating your mind maybe. So that's the, that's the, what I would say. So I'm doing all that now. No, I think that's good advice, and I'm glad you're taking it. You know, I I, I think uh, self awareness, at least for me, mm-hmm. is a hard thing to learn. And uh, at, at least for me, it's been uh, an an evolution. I think my wife would say over the 26 years that we've been married, and yeah, maybe sinking in just now. Um, you know what's so- helpful for self awareness is. Um- working with engineers <laughs> for oh. your entire career <laughs> yeah. because there's something in the engineer culture. And I, it's funny because I walked into it, I think, messing up a lot and feeling weird about my interactions with my colleagues all the time. Google was like a very engineer, product-driven culture. And it it taught me so much because I would, for example send them an email with way too many words and flowery language. Try, just trying to get across, like very young me would say, you know, trying to get across um, something like a recommendation. I think we should talk to TechCrunch or something, but it would take like 17 paragraphs. And like a typical engineer who's both busy and just communicates in a different style would write back, I don't see why this would be a good use of my time, you know, Bob or something. And I remember like feeling very reactive to that. That like, feels like a lot from an engineer, by the way. Yeah, I would exactly. expect like no. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or, fine. or yeah. And you know, <laughs> I used to take I would want to write back like something spicier back, you know, like I always wanted to. And it's like, why am I so offended? And so it didn't take long, but engineers have taught me how to I'm like, no, actually, Bob is literally giving me the most honest take he can. He doesn't have either the ability or the desire to think about tone. He's not adding 17 other words to make it like, thank you so much for this thoughtful recommendation. And I, you know, he's just like, I don't have time for that. And like, Rachel knows that knows me and like, I'm just gonna. And so, you know, I think that's like, was the start of a lot of self-awareness for me professionally, which is, why am I so mad about like a tone of an email where actually if Bob had said this to me in person, I probably wouldn't even care. So maybe there's something going on with the way I read emails. So yeah, self-awareness is- No, I, think- I, I don't think it's you, by the way. I think that's yeah. a really interesting point. I, I think I think so often what happens is we provide a voice. Mm-hmm. We give a voice, a tone, inflection, attitude, to whether it be an email, a text, a Slack, anything else that's written, yeah, we give it this stuff that doesn't exist. No, and if you were just having a conversation, yeah, it, is it you're not offended at all? Well, that's why you have to assume. I mean, you have to assume good intentions. I mean, this is what I teach, and I think as our world goes increasingly remote, and as a communicator, I've learned uh, you know a lot about this, but. I do feel like when I mentor or manage folks, it, sometimes they're not even younger. You know, it's just folks I'm managing. Um, a really big lesson, especially for for communications people working in technical environments, is um, to always assume good intentions 
And if it feels really like it's not a good intention to hop on the phone, to your point, and just try to figure this out. But the more you react to something, just the worse something gets. And the other thing about our lives these days, you know, I think remote and I think just a pandemic, I keep saying like, I think a global pandemic put everyone in a pretty bad mood. It was like not. <laughs> yeah, thank. <laughs> yeah, it was like not not a good time. And I think people are still cranky and not themselves, you know, about that. And we forget that, I think. And um, I, uh, so I, I also encourage someone, even if there's a clear like freak out in co- communication, whether it's a DM or a signal or an email or a Slack, and it's like, okay, I'm not reading too much into this. This is like genuinely like offensive or like fairly aggressive, but it's still like on some level, it's just going back and forth. Like that is also such a waste of time and effort and energy. And so I also try to encourage, I think to your point about self-awareness, I think all the time about like the older I get, the more I learn the lesson that someone's going through something always. And if someone is, um, I don't think anyone's naturally, it's very rarely someone's just like an asshole. So, so when someone's kind of sending you a message that takes you back, I, I still think the right approach is like staying calm and being kind and assuming they're doing their best and assuming something wild is going on with them personally if they're behaving in a certain way. So, you know, I, th- I, I think the, the, cor- the corollary there is that 99% of the time, Maybe mm-hmm. even more than that. It actually has nothing to do with you, the recipient of the behavior. Right. Right. It's what's going on with them. And you have no idea what it is. Yeah. And the, 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 the idea of having, of giving grace, of having empathy, mm-hmm. exhibiting and expressing kindness. Mm-hmm. Um, all things which seem to be missing uh, in in the world maybe a little bit at the moment. I think when you have even a little bit of power too, you know, so I'm more senior these days in organizations than I was in that first chapter of my career. And so maybe younger me would try to give grace, but it's also, you kind of want to stand up for yourself. You kind of want to make sure you're not I don't know when you're, you're, you're just not as empowered sometimes when you're earlier in your career, you're younger. But I do think for those of us who are kind of reaching senior positions and leadership positions, whether it's within an organization or even in an industry, you know, for me, it's crypto and web three. Um, I think it's like, I have a very strong obligation to think about grace and to think about kindness and to think about how do you turn an empathy and how do you turn down the volume versus turning up the volume or up the outrage or up the conflict. And so I take that part of my life these days really seriously. I mean, it's even on Twitter. I just feel, I feel like a personal responsibility to not flamethrow on Twitter. And, and I think, and I feel like that actually takes some self-control sometimes because you can log on to that website and start to feel (laughs) mad about something. But I, I actually feel like for those of us Again, like the more I think empathy you can like literally put into the world, the better that world will be, especially in a like very remote kind of universe we all live in now. Yeah. So I mentioned at the outset sort of the career progression, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. I feel like maybe I should buy lottery tickets with you. But so why Google. So Google was really the beginning of what I'll just call your trajectory. Yeah. Why did you want to be at Google? Because if I remember correctly, you really wanted to be at Google. You wanted to get there. Can can you can you tell us why? Yeah. Well, let's see. I started out working in politics at a at a Democratic consulting firm. That's where I did work with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, very early on, I think I was a bit disillusioned with politics. Can you know, I wonder why, but it was also at a time when, you know, Democrats were really losing back then, you know, Bush v. Gore. And, um, I was like, this is like a losing coalition and losing feel, losing felt bad. Um, but I also just had a real 
desire to do something where there were really smart people and they were making a, a real impact on the world in a way that I felt was super interesting and positive. So there was a side of me that thought maybe the entertainment industry, maybe the media, you know, but I was starting to think outside of politics increasingly. I swear to you, I think I saw an Oprah. So Google ha- was public, had gone public. And I saw an Oprah episode where she was doing the best places to work. Um, and I, she, she featured Google and I was like, oh, I would love to work there. And I was like, oh, and if you, you get to live in the Bay Area, that seems cool. And I, I also wanted to be around. It's funny. We talk about remote work now so much. And I remember being in 24, 25 and really wanting to be with lots of other 20 somethings. Like where if I was going to move and be away from family and friends, I thought, oh, I just don't want to be like the only 20 year old in the building. Like it would be so fun. And so Google at the, so I came down and I, I actually got a job at Fleischman Hillard in their tech practice very briefly. And then there was this um, organization called Cutline that was bringing in a bunch of contractors to embed full-time on the Google comms team because Google was growing so fast and they couldn't hire fast enough because their hiring process for engineers was slow and comms people were like not the priority, but they desperately needed comms people. So I was part of this cohort um, to embed on this team of young people and I didn't have stock. I was a contract. I mean, I rode the Google bus. I was, you know, felt like a Googler in all the ways, except, um, you know, and they had a very, uh, like a kind of, you know, uh, elitist screening, you know, I think because you had, had to go to Ivy League to get a, an Ivy League school to get a job in the comms team full time at the time. Um, and so it didn't make me bitter. And I don't think I had a chip on my shoulder about that. I felt super grateful. To I'd be, have a fucking chip on my shoulder. I, know, I would. Over time, I, re- I think that's what's drawn me to Web3, actually, and um, drew me to cultures that are a little bit like um, anti-elitist in, in a lot of ways and a little bit more like um, communitarian and democratized. And um, and so I learned a lot. I mean, I was the great part about it um, was I was kind of learning at the feet of the women and men in communications who were kind of building what a new tech communications playbook could look like or would look like for the foreseeable future. So I feel like a lot of the 101 basics that journalists and folks like myself kind of um, use today came from that group that I was learning from back then. Yeah. So, um, but I just, I loved California and I loved, I, I got my dream came true. I was around a bunch of 20 year olds, 20 somethings. We were, we had the best time. It a little bit felt like college. You know, we were riding those bikes around the Google campus. We were, like playing hooky, you know, when our bosses couldn't find us and we were eating at In-N-Out Burger in Menlo Park or something. And then we were working till like one in the morning on stuff and crashing. I, and think, so- I, I think that In-N-Out, that, that In-N-Out is like right over the fence, by yeah. the way. Yeah, from, and from- so we, would be, we would be like, and we didn't even have, you know, iPhones back then? I forget what we even had, but it would be like, do you think they're looking for us? It was just like a couple <laughs> of adults. And like a ton of 20 somethings. And, um, you know, it was really like fun time, but that, that Google time period, I was there for four or five years. Um, that's my whole network to this day. Some of my best friends and who have been opened professional doors for me are part of that Google cohort at that time. So even some of the product folks who were there that I worked really closely with and the BD folks and the marketers, it's funny, I've, I haven't thought about this too much lately, but the, that was like the kind of professional cohort that I stuck with for a really long time. And to this day, we're still really good friends. God, there's so many places that I want to go with this <laughs> this most recent part of the conversation. Well, one, one of which is the difference between you, who goes to UW and is a communications major, and, mm-hmm. and you're at Google, and, and your background and your experience relative to uh, those who who went to Ivy League schools, um, mm. but I'm not going to go there mm. uh, uh, because I'd actually want to connect those dots to what happens in early childhood education and and how a- actually the 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 proof is the statistics show it actually has nothing to do with the school and more to do with the parents. Oh, really? 
and oh yeah and and yeah. and my 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 thesis is that if you draw that uh forward how many ever years mm. right you, yeah your character your resilience your grit your ability to figure it out is already mm. embedded and so when you get there yeah. you do you as we like to say at alto and yeah. and all right. Anyway, well, I said we weren't going to go there, but now we're going there. Tell me. Well, it's, I think it's, um, I think it's like, look, I worked with really, I mean, on the other hand, there were friends of mine who went to Harvard and Yale and, you know, who were brilliant and they actually had like a better kind of training in school than I did. I kind of resented that, like on some level, you know, they were farther ahead than me just in some ways, like they were, there were books that I was like, oh, why didn't I read that book? You know, and it was like, you know, I just didn't have the rigorous private school, high school training. And I didn't go to a really demanding academic, you know, college was hard and, um, and I, I'm proud of what I did there, but I just could, I remember I had this window into, I think when you're 24, now it doesn't matter, right? Like you could run into people and people are either brilliant and in their own ways and wonderful or they're not. And you wouldn't even know where anyone went to school, but I could sense a little bit of a experience difference from my friends at the age of like 24 and 25. Like, wait, where did you guys learn, learn that? When did you learn that? And it was like in college. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I didn't learn that. So there was a part of me that was catching up. There was a confidence gap there for sure. I wouldn't even call it, you know, women talk about imposter syndrome. To your point, I think I knocked imposter syndrome out writ large at Google. Like, it doesn't matter if I'm a woman or whatever. I simply, my dad's not a senator. I didn't go to, you know, it was a very like, it was the hottest place to be. It was just this like, everyone who knew someone and went to a great college was part of that community. And I definitely felt like a fish out of water in some ways. And yet I made all these great connections. So I think my ability to, I think it wasn't just, okay, I'm going to be work the hardest or I'm going to turn out the best work. Or I think what ultimately, like what I worked on at Google in terms of confidence and what I think ended up um, helping me throughout the rest of my career was Maybe I can form the strongest bonds. Like maybe because communications is so much about it's so collaborative. You have to get the product marketing team and the engineers and the PM and the CEO and the execs and then the journalists and then my own team members. Everyone has to sort of see your vision and you have to kind of herd cats a lot to say this is the message and this is the positioning and this is the go to market and or or if you're in a crisis this is how i think we should handle it and here's the next step and so i think i kind of keyed in on yes i'm going to work hard but i think because i'm not like an entitled person i don't nothing's ever come you know specifically all that easy and i didn't get this training that all my friends around me got I can be kind of humble and, and I think that's winning and I think I can build trust and I think I can, um, I can show off my intelligence by the types of questions I ask and the kind of information that I gather. And that ended up, so that kind of led me to making friends with like, not always just trying to get as close to the like exec as possible. I would make really good friends with, you know, the product manager who's super junior in my age, but we would like die of laughter together getting through something really hard. And then I would ask him like, I'm sorry, if I write the sentence this way, I feel like this is clearer than what you're saying. And I was like, but is it right? And he would, you know, and that, and he would be like, oh yeah, you're right. Like, I don't know why we use all this jargon. And, <laughs> and he, that would be someone who later is the vice president of product somewhere like Twitter or whatever and would say, yeah, I want to work with my friend Rachel who like, it didn't feel like, oh, that comms person I worked with or that person who was always next to the CEO. She was just like a friend, like a person I want to hang out with who was also, we would jam out on something together and we'd get it done and we'd feel really proud about it and then we'd go eat it in and out. So I think I always tell younger people too, like, you don't have to chase the center of power all the time. I think that is a misperception. You don't have to try to get, there was a lot of kind of at Google, like get in the room with the most senior execs and try to have influence. And 
I just was like, I don't know how to play that game. I don't really want to, but I think, I think what I'm really good at is just like authentic relationships with people I really respect. Um, and people who like, I just want to be around. And I suppose if they go on to do something really great, like I would want to be around them there too. And I think they'd want to be around me as well. So that was my, that ended up being my superpower in that environment. Um, and to this day, that's kind of how things have gone. Yeah. What, so what I what I hear you saying, and I could not agree more, whether professional or personal, and and for so many people, the two are the same. Mm-hmm. It's about relationships. Yeah, yeah, it's totally about relationships, and I think, you know, tech as an industry is not perfect. It's definitely not perfect. Um, it's not a perfect anything, but for me. I got exposure to some other industries, um, politics being one of them. And there is something you can kind of find. I was very lucky that I was able to find actual merit-driven environments where the merit part was, you know, I could just, I was just lucky to be surrounded, whether it was Google or Twitter or Facebook or Coinbase. These are places that attract really smart people who are really creative and as excited to be there as I am and like feeling really like fortunate to be there and like excited by the opportunity. And I think when you look at it that way, rather than kind of a political way to your point about relationships, I just felt like a kid in the candy store, like, Oh my gosh, I just get to hang with these gals and guys and we're going to work on stuff together and I'm better because they're so smart. And hopefully I add something to all this. Um, So that kind of joy and like of like, and I'm very extroverted too. So like heading in there to be like, I couldn't tell Rachel, what are we building? Yeah, let's do that. You know, um, that can be infectious too. Actually, I found people, a lot of, um, non-technical people try to match technical people's energy. So engineers sometimes can be like product people can be very like introverted. And I think some people, when they're trying to fit in, will say, um, we'll be like, oh, they're serious and introverted. <laughs> and so I should like match that. And I think my super They start playing all sad songs. All sad songs. And they're just like, yes. And they try to sound as serious with the data and stuff like that. And I just couldn't be that way if I tried. So I, I think what I end up like my coworkers at Han Ventures or some of the folks I worked with at Coinbase would tell you, that I think people, you know, and to some people, it's probably like deeply annoying. But in most cases, I'm like so jazzed, very stoked to be on the team. And I'm like, and now the mom in me is like, you built that? Good for you. Way to go. Let's do comms about it. That's exciting. So, so yeah. you, you just said the word jazz. I want to ask you, um, you were a jazz singer, were you not? Yes, I was in high school. Mm-hmm. I was. Will you sing something for us? No, I cannot right now, Eric. No. Oh, Rachel, you can't. You're Here's the deal. I will come to Nashville. Yes, you will. I need to we have mutual friends in common. We and do. I just need at this age, I use, I just need a little bit of tequila, just like a little. And then <laughs> a little bit and I love um karaoke, you know, with the band behind you. We got so it. I, Turn I'm, it. There's like none of that in the Bay Area. I'm assuming like my pilgrimage is Nashville where I can live out my dreams singing. But well, these days it has to be like a little bit drunk. Like a little, it, a little no, bit drunk. No, no worries. We can help on, on both counts, by the okay. way. And Nashville's right. expanding, as you know, an ever-growing, uh, fantastic and interesting technology community. So we, we've got room for you. We, uh, we right. always want smart, interesting, extroverted, tequila singing, jazz uh folks to to come to town um okay i'm gonna let you off for now i will tell you that i put in our slack i put i i i put in our slack the other day um because i saw i saw this tweet someone had posted this tweet about how come there are no company songs oh we we have you know we're nashville right we've got vocalists musicians songwriters we we've got the creative community so so i put the challenge out that by by our summer party which happens in june something i don't know yeah i'm dying to hear what the alto song is going to be i'm dying to hear too i see like 
maybe like Marin Morris for you guys. Um, Chris Stapleton. I'm a huge country fan. That's the other random thing. I love jazz and I love country. Um, but well, if, okay, if you could choose your song now, Eric, what would your song be? No, we have to write it. Oh, we have oh to, you write it. We have to write it. I don't want just a company song. I want an alto song. I see. That's so sweet. So, yeah, you guys have the talent. Yeah, well, I, I can't wait to hear what the hook is going to be. Like, yeah. I have something in my head, but my stuff is always stupid. So, yeah. but we have, we have actual talented people at Alto. So, I, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to see what that that's the challenge out there. I, I haven't gotten any comments on that Slack comment, by the way. So, I'm going to have to go back it. and say, hey, I'm serious. Like, what are we doing here? We I'm a because I'm, again, I'm so extroverted in an introverted world. Someone described it to me as being like, this is very flattering to those of us who feel like we're this way, but I don't mean it that way. Like being a Captain Kirk in a world full of Spocks. <laughs> well, I just have accepted. I know they love me. I know we're good colleagues and friends, but I'm like the queen of a Slack message that gets crickets. For days. Yeah, yeah, nobody thinks I nobody thinks I'm funny. They 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 <laughs> they're, they're nice to me actually. I think by not saying anything. But by the way, our our, our holiday uh, our holiday party pet that this last year ended mm -hmm. up at karaoke bars on on Broadway as you would expect for a a Nashville based company, and the talent on our yeah. team, the people who got up on stage and sang, including Tara Fung. Have you met Tara? No. Okay, so Tara's, uh, Tara recently has moved on from Alto. She was Chief Revenue Officer. Andreessen Horowitz, Chris Dixon, your buddy, yeah. tapped Tara to be uh, CEO of a company she is now the co-founder of. Um, and she's on stage doing Eminem. And she... She crushes it. She kills I think, it. I think karaoke brings out like the best in teams, the best in people. I totally enjoy it. But I always caveat because I'm like such a karaoke pusher and I can be pushy about it. So I always <laughs> caveat with teams like if this sounds like hell and like a nightmare, just DM me and there is no judgment. And I will think of something else we can do as a team. So I always like to give that like I understand things That's that I love are not everyone's cup of tea. and. I, it's a safe place to tell me like there's Rachel. the empathy for you yeah, the empathy and the kindness I then karaoke with my colleagues yeah but not me I love it yeah so 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 um I'm gonna take us take us back to um sort of the professional first this is all professional I mean holiday holiday parties are holiday that's parties. very that's very yeah. professional so you go from Twitter you go to Facebook and then you go, I, I think there's an in-between, maybe Spark Capital or something. And then you get mm -hmm. to Coinbase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 2018. So I first started trying, by the way, started trying to, to do something with Coinbase for Alto, either late 2017 or, or early mm -hmm. 2018. Most people still have not heard the word Bitcoin and certainly not the word blockchain at this point. Yeah. How do you say this is me? This is where I got to go. What happens? Well, I kind of do this thing like Google was technically a growth era time for them. You know, it was only 5,000 people when I started there and it grew a ton over the five years, right? Like probably tripled in size, maybe quadrupled during that time. If you think about Google's trajectory, um, Twitter was absolutely bananas. I mean, I got there when it was around 300 people and it grew just from a people perspective to give you a sense. It grew over four years to like 7,000 people or something insane and through an IPO again. And I just love it. But then it's almost like I have to like take a break and drink water, you know? And so I kind of like Facebook was quite busy, but it was definitely felt like a break for me. And then Spark Capital was like, a break where I kind of reset and think about, and I, it took me a second. I felt like I was like bouncing around jobs too much. And then I realized, no, I'm not bouncing around. I'm like a bit of a growth stage athlete. And this is actually a sweet spot for me. And I'm growing into this. Coinbase was so awesome because I met um, a bunch of the, Brian Armstrong, the CEO was basically after the 2017 Bitcoin bull run, um, the company was, kind of the breakout star, the breakout brand. I loved the emphasis of trust that they 
kind of placed in their systems and in their core of the business. I felt like that was kind of a departure from the web two companies that I had worked for, which were about growth. And this was like about trust and compliance and, um, but it, you know, speaking of Chris Dixon, I think he's the one who said, follow the nerd energy. And I was so like, I, like I was telling you earlier, I really love engineering culture. I, I do. I love a culture that's driven by product people and the way they think and the way engineers think. And Coinbase just had incredibly strong eng vibes. I mean, I was going to be the very first comms leader there. There was no team. There was no market or marketing. That's always to me like a good, to your point about lotto tickets or knowing how to pick them. I think for like for non-technical people, that's that's one lens to view it, like how technical is the group. And it didn't feel like I wasn't interested in fintech. I wasn't interested in anything that was sort of like fashion or, you know, travel. Like none of that interested me. I was so, the, as I dug into that opportunity, it felt like a genuine paradigm shift, like an actual new infrastructure was being built out that would not just impact finance, it would impact potentially a lot of things. Theoretically, you could imagine it doing that. And then, so that felt really important to me at that time. Um, and, and so I didn't see it as like ideologically or from a like political perspective or even a financial perspective. I saw it from a genuine, like I was part of one web revolution and this feels like the smartest people who build things are headed into this space. And this is a company where I can have an impact. And then in every role that I'd had up until then, I, by Twitter, I was sort of like second in command, you know, and I'd never run my own. I was never on an exec team. I was never uh, the on the leadership team. And I was never in charge of the entire function. And I threw myself into that process, actually. It took them a while to talk me into like taking that role seriously because I just felt burnt out. But once I did take it seriously, I recognized I think I was kind of one of many they were talking to. And I did switch and feel like I really want this. I think this will be career defining for me. I think I'm ready to lead. And I don't know like half of what I'm telling them I know, but I will figure it out. And I think, I, and then I think there's a part of me is like, you know, my kids are young ish. And so I probably have one more of these, like this big of a swing in me before I have to like go get a grown up job one of these days. And, um, and so I just really wanted it. And so, yeah, it was the, the leadership founder run the, the trust piece. And it felt like from a technical perspective, a full paradigm shift. And, um, that was the filter and that I was really lucky, um, that I got the role. Well, not super lucky. I mean, not totally lucky because I worked really hard, I think, to convince them that I was right. But they did end up telling me when they hired me that they were, they felt like they were taking a chance on me a bit because I was, I think I skewed a bit younger than some of the other candidates. And it's just such a, um, as you know, the space is very like the regulatory challenges, the challenges that Coinbase was going through, the amount of money on the line, the valuation of the company. And so I'd had this great kind of singular experience at all these companies at all these times. But I do think I skewed. It wasn't viewed as um, one person told me like a heavyweight, the way the other candidates who were up for that job were viewed. And so um, I don't know why people ended up telling me this. Well, but so, so by the way, I find that 100% fucking bizarre yeah. that they say you weren't the heavyweight. You're you haven't done it before. You're too young. Well, let's, let's be clear. It's none of the current execs who are there now. There were other people who had let that slip, but it wasn't Brian or or anyone like I, that. I, I I don't care who I don't care yeah. who it was, and I'm not pointing yeah. fingers. I I I'm just, I'm I'm just talking about the environment that you're walking into, which is, well, you really weren't a heavyweight. You kind of. I, I don't know if they went so far as to say you weren't the favorite or we offered it to somebody else first and they didn't take well, actually, it. Or The person who offered me the job ended up telling me you're the number one choice for the team. But there was a there was a hardcore kind of negotiating element to it. And there was just a little bit came out around your first choice. But I feel like the team loves you, but I'm taking a chance on you because you're not as experienced but, you know, the whole thing, I always love, I don't mind being underestimated. I mean, um, Katie Hahn and I talk about this a lot. And 
I took that as whatever, like grab a seat on the rocket ship. And I just knew at that point in my career, I knew that if I could get into that seat, um, they would feel um, really happy with the choice like very quickly. And that's what ended up happening. I actually got closer to the to Brian, the CEO. He wasn't really in the hiring process. And him and I um, got along and clicked like very well right away. Again, because I think he's super technical. He's an engineer. So that um, that worked out really well. So I was off and running. And um, I think if Brian had been involved, it would have been a different conversation. Yeah. The, the, but the, but this person who's telling you all this, and I, I, I'm not going to let go. I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna pull on this thread for just a second. Did this person tell you why the why you were the team's number one? That's what I want to know. They did actually. They ended up giving me the feedback that you're the team's number one choice because they actually had a process where they had each of the people, the finalists for this role give a presentation on the first 100 days. What would your first 100 days look like we as vice president of communications? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and it was just pretty open-ended. It wasn't even like, here's what we think. And they said, and I'm not surprised by this, that I, and I think because I was so close in my career to being, when you're director level, so coming as from a director from- You're doing the work. You were doing those plans yep. like for a boss. So yep. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I had like big ideas and really big thoughts and strong opinions about the, that moment in time for Coinbase and what uh, kind of communications and reputation management and potentially even policy and marketing could do for that company. And, and I could kind of analyze the environment they were in at that moment. So I put in a ton of work. I had a day job, but I put in a ton of work, work at night, work during the day, tons of research. And I was so into it that when I presented, of course, I had a ton of energy and I had a ton of enthusiasm and passion. And and I made sure to come with like, I felt really sharp insights. I'd interviewed a ton of people to really understand the space. And they just said that like, it felt like the other candidates had not put that much effort or energy into it. So you know, sometimes I think there's hard work Get you know, some people might have 10, 10 years on me and, and I'll have 10 years on someone, but one day there could be a person who doesn't have as much experience as me, but they have more energy or they're more passionate about something. And that, that can be the winning thing. A hundred, I could not agree more. So, um, a, a couple more things. Do you have a few more minutes? I have to go pretty soon. I'm pretty late for my next thing, but yeah. Uh, okay, so let me yeah. just ask you this: um, two two things. Hmm. The first is, you know, after Coinbase, you actually go to Andreessen before leaving with Katie to start Han Ventures. Yeah. What? Why do you leave? You know, the VC firm in the world to go do a new thing. More risk. More risk um, at this point in my career definitely doesn't feel as risky. Feels just like mm -hmm. I have the freedom to do what seems fun and cool and awesome. And thank you, Coinbase. Thank you, Coinbase. And so um, Katie is just a star, and she's a mentor and a friend. And I think when someone like that asks you to shepherd their brand and their, frankly, their their legacy um, as they build their empire. Um, I actually felt like it's a privilege to be asked that and that if I can have some role in shaping that for her, I would be delighted. So it was an easy. Make sure thing. make sure you tell her that she crushed it at FTX crypto, by the way. I it will. Was, she, well, Eric she was, has to run. She, she, she was fabulous. So last question. Mm -hmm. Two people I need to have on the show. Two people you need to have on the show. Well, you have to have my colleague, Tamika Tilleman. He okay. has an insanely interesting background. Um, I, I'll, well, we can tell you offline. And yep. you also have to have Emily Choi, the COO at Coinbase. She's so, incredible. so Emily's going to be on you. It, it, it's going to be on you to get Emily to be on the okay. show. By the way, I will. Now, I'm 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 holding you to that one. I'm going to do it. I'm actually <laughs> holding you to both. So, Rachel. Thank you so much for being on the show. I can't wait for this to get published. I'm, of course, going to let you know when it happens because okay. we're going to put your communication skills to to test. Okay. And we're going to send it all out there. Thanks, Thank sir. you again for being on the show. Sorry to Thank make you late. You. No worries. Take care.
The All Together Show is brought to you by Alto. Alto knows that achieving true portfolio diversification means investing in more than just stocks and bonds. That's why Alto developed a streamlined platform to make it easy and cost-effective to invest tax-advantaged retirement savings in alternatives, assets like real estate, venture capital, and crypto that are outside of the public markets and available through Alto's growing list of investment partners. To learn more, visit altoira.com altogether.